Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. We're going to be hearing from Anders and Beverly Gyllenhaal, authors of the book, A Wing and a Prayer, The Race to Save, Our Vanishing Birds. My name is Chelsea Benson, and I'm going to be facilitating today's conversation. Today's webinar is hosted from Ithaca, New York, and I want to read a statement acknowledging the Indigenous people as the original inhabitants of this area. Cornell University is located on the traditional homelands of the Gayukono, the Cayuga Nation. The Gayukono are members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, an alliance of six sovereign nations with a historic and contemporary presence on this land. The Confederacy precedes the establishment of Cornell University, New York State, and the United States of America. We acknowledge the painful history of the Gayukono dispossession and honor the ongoing connection of Gayukono people, past and present, to these lands and waters. We are streaming this webinar on both Zoom and YouTube, and I have a few tech notes for our audience. Closed captioning is available on Zoom. If you'd like to turn those captions on or off, please click, click that captions button at the bottom of your screen. And if you don't see a captions button, click the three dots that say more. For those watching on YouTube, click the CC button at the bottom of the video to turn on the captions. For our Zoom audience to ask Anders and Beverly questions, click on the Q&A button and type in your question. We're only using the Zoom chats for technical support. If you're watching on YouTube and you'd like to ask Anders and Beverly a question, use the chat feature. I have colleagues behind the scenes answering questions and sharing information in the chats on, for both Zoom and YouTube. That was a lot of announcements. So we're gonna get started. I'm very excited to welcome Anders and Beverly to tonight's webinar. Hi, hello, hello. thank you. Uh, so thank you for joining us. Uh, the book is a real gem, and I'm really excited to dive into it with you all tonight. Um, I want to do a quick introduction for our audience so they have a little context for, for our topic for tonight. So Anders and Beverly Gyllenhaal are veteran journalists and authors of the new book, A Wing in the Prayer. And after hearing the news in 2019 of nearly 3 billion birds lost, Anders and Beverly packed up their Airstream trailer and traveled over 25,000 miles across the Americas, chronicling the efforts of conservationists, scientists, ranchers, and politicians to help save birds from extinction. Some of their stopping places on their journey intersect with the lab's own research efforts, including Director Emeritus John Fitzpatrick with Florida Scrub Jays in Central Florida, researcher Connor Wood with California Spotted Owls deep in the Sierra Nevada mountains, and here in Ithaca, New York, with researcher Adrian Doctor, who uses radar to forecast bird migration, and with staff from Merlin and eBird, whose efforts help fuel research and conservation around the world. So Anders and Beverly, they're going to take us on their journey, and they have some lovely photographs to share, which they took, um, and they're going to share their discoveries, and we're going to follow up our session uh, with a Q&A. So like I said, if you have questions for Anders and Beverly, please put them in the Q&A on Zoom or in the chat and YouTube. Um, sure. But I'm going to let you take it away, and we're excited to hear from you this evening. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, sort of also thanks to all the folks at Cornell who helped us so much with our research. Just hearing you go through all those names, it brings back so many memories about how patient everybody was with us and generous to share everything. And um, thanks to everybody in the audience um, on the webinar. We really appreciate your time tonight. And um, we're looking forward to talking with you about our very favorite topic, birds. And as Chelsea says, our, our book is about this passionate cast of characters, scientists and birders and wildlife uh, experts, hunters, ranchers, philanthropists who are working to save birds at, at what we all know is a really fragile time. And uh, we're at this extraordinary juncture because two opposing forces are at work at the same time when it comes to birds. One is the enormous pressure that's eroding more than half the species in North America, as we all know so well. But at the same time, there's a whole series of, of responses to those pressures, innovative ideas in, in conservation, very promising 
technologies and a long list of um, really interesting rescue missions that we're going to talk some about that are going on across the hemisphere. So the, the technology of bird study is advancing at this, you know, head spinning and really encouraging pace. And at the same time, ideas, new ideas are, are, are emerging basically about how do we coexist with birds at a time of a lot of an environmental disruption. And that's why we call this a race. So which of these forces is going to prevail? And after talking with over 300 people, we came to realize that this is probably gonna be decided fairly soon. Um, Ian Owens, who is the director of the Cornell Lab, um, told us that he thought that the next several years are going to be pivotal. And as the um, CEO of Audubon, um, Elizabeth Gray put it, we have about a decade to get this right. And of course, our topic is birds, but it's also a slice, as you all know, of the broader environmental story that is one of the themes uh, of our time. And birds are a particularly good lens through watch to watch what's, what's happening. So I'm gonna switch us over and put the slides on as Beverly picks up from there. So probably the very first thing you need to know is that we, unlike all of these other people, are not scientists. We're not bird experts. And I'd be willing to bet you that we're not the best birders on this um, webinar tonight. But what we are, are journalists and storytellers. And what we really wanted to do with this book was to translate the breadth of all of this information that we found into um, stories that we hoped would resonate with all kinds of people. And um, we've obviously been captivated by birds ourselves. We're just in awe of their amazing mechanics and their beauty and how their nature's workhorses. We um, know that they um, pollinate the lands and the flowers and the trees. And um, they also um, consume 500 tons of, of insects every single year. And they pollinate, they fertilize uh, both the land and the oceans, and they clean up nature's refuse. What would we do without our vultures? Um, and they also spread seeds that fuel the um, grasslands and the forests. And our favorite thing too, or one of mine, is that um, so many studies are now coming out that um, birding is really good for your mental health. So we got hooked on birds about 12 years ago. What was happening is that we were living in a condo in downtown DC and we started getting out of the city and into nature on the weekends. And even though we both grew up with bird feeders and we knew cardinals and blue jays and maybe a couple of owls and some bluebirds, but we started seeing a lot of birds that we just didn't have a clue what they were. So what would happen was during the day, Anders would photograph birds, and you're seeing those photos right now. And at night, we would um, sit with the old-fashioned bird guide, and we would go page by page through the book, looking to see, well, which bird has pink legs, and which birds have like orange bill underneath and the brown bill on top, or vice versa, so that we could try to figure out exactly what it was we were seeing. And mind you, this was about 12 years ago. So it was before you could just upload your photo to Merlin Bird ID and get the, uh, the answer right away. So um, we didn't really mind that so much because it really kind of gave us a real foundation in um, kind of what, what really puts a bird together, if you will. But um, then the next thing that happened was our regular job started to wind down. And um, we just got more and more obsessed with birds to the point that um, <laughs> all of our relatives and our children started making fun of us pretty much all the time. And uh, we have a whole entire wardrobe uh, full of t-shirts with bird cartoons yeah. on them. Um, but anyway, uh, one thing led to another and eventually we started a website which is called flyinglessons.us, what we're learning from the birds. And a little tiny plug for that, it's a non-commercial um, website, so we hope you'll visit. And if you want to, you can sign up for our occasional newsletter where we kind of let you know what we're, what we're looking at, what we're seeing. And so eventually, after a few years of that, um, it led to this book. So one of the underlining themes of the book is the relationship between 
people and birds. And an unavoidable conclusion I think people will all share is that Americans love birds until they get in our way. You know, of course, over the past century, whole segments of species have been threatened. Uh, you know, going back uh, for uh, uh, many, many years. Uh, and each time this has happened, Americans, and this is our point, have stepped forward to, to, to do things to save birds. And this, this goes back to uh, the turn of the 1900s when, you know, the, the slaughter of birds like this heron and uh, egrets, spoonbills were used to, to, to provide uh, women's hats. And then uh, uh, in the 30s and 40s, the, the loss of birds, uh, of ducks and geese from the, the droughts uh, uh, were responded with a whole new laws to protect uh, game birds. And then, of course, in the 60s and 70s, um, we realized that birds like uh, the bald eagles and ospreys, condors, many others were disappearing because of pesticides. And that's when we passed the Endangered Species Act, of course, and launched the Environmental Protection Agency, and the general environmental awareness began to grow. And we're in a similar place today, as we, we all know, but the crisis is deeper and different in the past. And as Chelsea mentioned, you know, we recently seen the most significant research uh, uh, in, in generations done by partly by Cornell Lab and the American Bird Conservancy where they figured out to count the number of birds for the very first time. And um, here's the, 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 the uh, graphic that the lead computational scientist sent out when he realized that what it amounted to was a third, almost a third of the birds in, in North America have been lost since the 1970s, that it amounted to uh, 3 uh, billion birds. And um, a profound uh, 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 discovery and, and the research answered all kinds of big questions, but it raised a lots of others. You know, what, what's being done? What can be done that isn't? Where is this all leading? There's so much written about birds. When you think about it, you know, wonderful books on iconic species from eagles to owls and just tons of guides and magnificent photos books. What seemed to be missing was a deep look at, being, at what's being done to save birds. So what we decided to do um, was to get out onto the front lines of where the work was actually being done. And so it happens that we had a, a little 23 foot Airstream trailer and it's appropriately called a flying cloud. And um, we converted it into a mobile office. We sort of took out part of the seating and put in our little desk and we got rid of extra clothes and filled the overhead bins with file folders and even made room for a little printer underneath a little table there. Um, and if you don't count the bed and the bathroom, it actually has about 50 square feet of living space. And I space. have to interrupt here and just say, this makes it look uh, better than it actually was because this was a photo taken by a, a friend that's a photographer. I think it was a wide angle lens and you know the, the beautiful background. Uh, it was pretty crowded. But we still managed uh, somehow. So we started out from our home in Raleigh, North Carolina. And um, then we went to Florida and drove all the way across the country to Wyoming and then on to California. And eventually we put the Airstream in dry dock for a little while and we traveled to Hawaii and um, Ecuador. And so we want to um, touch on a few of these mini stories uh, to give you a sense of the rescue missions that are um, going on across the Americas and what um, our birds are really up against and also how fascinating and complex this work is. And most importantly, um, what are the prospects of having a real impact? Yeah, and so these are real quick looks at stories that we go into far more depth of on a course, starting with the Florida grasshopper sparrow, which is, uh, as many of you will know, the target of, a, you know, kind of a desperate scientific intervention after it dropped to just 44 remaining birds uh, uh, some years ago. This is the first story that we, we tell in the book, how the scientists kind of coax the birds back into health by breeding chicks in a laboratory setting and then planting them out on the prairie. Here's a group of scientists heading out with the first um, group of these chicks and then watching over them like uh, you know helicopter parents. Um, <laughs> the numbers are slowly rising, but the sparrow saga uh, is also an illustration of how very much energy 
is is going is being spent on the far end of extinction and that's a policy that's probably going to need to change with so many birds in trouble and that's one of the issues that we dig into uh, in in the book so <clears throat> excuse me i really love this little puff ball of a bird <clears throat> it's the cerulean warbler and um, we talk about this uh, the cerulean warbler in our book to really um, touch on the um, specific story of songbirds and the migration. So the cerulean starts his journey um, up in the Appalachian Mountains, and he um, flies all the way down to the coast of the Gulf of Mexico and over to Colombia and Ecuador. And the cerulean is one of about a third of North America's songbirds and other birds that migrate to Latin America twice a year. And so we're gonna show you a few more photos of some of the other songbirds that migrate. They're all nice, wonderful little puff balls. <laughs> this is one of my favorites back here. Go, go back for just to have oh, a second. Yeah, the prothonotary yeah. warbler, he just kind of glows. He's so beautiful. Anyway, so um, as we began to um, look into more of this, we realized that a lot of these birds travel over as many as 12 different countries in their twice a year migrations. And we came to think about them sort of almost like children of divorced parents that don't always get along with each other. And when you think about it, we have custody of these birds for about half the year. And we just can't control what happens to them when they're in um, the different countries of Latin America and South America that um, don't always have the resources to spend on conservation that we do. And so we realize that these are some of the most um, difficult, the toughest birds to protect, but they're also some of the most important. If the hemisphere's birds are going to flourish, South America has got to be involved. And the, we're becoming to realize this just as more and more philanthropic money is going into these areas and starting to flow into the Southern hemisphere for protecting land that has never been protected before. And this is a longstanding story, of course, issues that have been uh, percolating for, for a very long time. We think there are, are, are some promising new developments. And of course, <clears throat> to make uh, one more point, which is that when these birds, uh, our North American birds get down there, they, uh, they join this massive, wonderful, uh, a gallery of almost three times as many birds in 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 South America uh, from toucans, the tanagers, uh, um, another tanager, flower piercer, uh, just endless numbers of, of of hummingbirds, of course, like this this train bearer. One of the biggest challenges birds face, of course, is how they thrive on um, diminishing chunks of habitat, uh, almost everywhere. And that's the challenging of a fascinating project that's underway, um, trying to uh, stabilize the Florida scrub jay. It was good to see him uh, on the on the front uh, uh, opening slides. Scrub jay has lost about 90% of its habitat, as well as about the same percentage of, of its uh, population as Florida has grown into, you know, the, the, the third most populous state. I and mean, this is one of the most studied birds on the planet. And of course, a longtime subject of Cornell's own uh, di director emeritus, John Fitzpatrick. And this project that we write about um, is run by the Archbold Biological Station in Central Florida, hooked uh, tiny trackers uh, into all of the, the, the relatively young birds to figure out what exactly they did all around uh, 24 hours a, a, a day. Um, these birds don't migrate, so trying to figure out what exactly they are doing in, in order to figure out what kinds of habitat and food, um, plant conditions will make them possible to make the most of that land. And the result is a blueprint that's being formed to try to protect this, this bird. It's nat the only native bird in Florida, but it's also a plan that can be used on, on many other birds as this is put together. So this is the California spotted owl, and he is the subject of the world's largest um, project using the science of sound or bioacoustics to rescue birds. Um, so the spotted owl lives high up in the um, Sierra Nevada mountain range, 
in places that are so vast and remote, they're nearly impossible to even drive through most of the time. So um, under the direction of Connor from the Cornell lab, scientists have figured out how to set up recorders across millions of acres of forest land. They basically go out and strap these recorders to the trunks of trees. And within a year, they'll have a million hours of sounds because if you think about it, owls hoot. So they're, um, they are easy to hear on these recorders. And then um, the lab figured out how to use um, artificial intelligence to go through and analyze all of these sounds and exactly pinpoint where in the mountain range the owls are. So there's a lot behind this story that it took to try to protect the birds, but it's an example of one of the really powerful uh, newer technologies that is so useful for birds because they uh, uh, are constantly uh, singing and, and calling, and so that's a way to track where they are in places that you otherwise uh, can't reach. And once they figure out where they are, they can go in and do take other measures to stabilize the birds, and we talk a lot about that in the book as well. Some of it's not so happy, so we'll let right. you see see that for yourself. <laughs> Um, so the largest and probably the most unusual conservation project in the country right now is in Hawaii. Um, researchers are trying to figure out how to save the last of the native forest birds like um, these honey creepers, iiwi and akia pola'au, uh, and here's the, the, the palila. Um, Hawaii, of course, is the world's capital of extinction. It's just overrun, particularly inland with invasive species of, of pigs and cows and mongoose and rats and cats. It's a long list that has decimated uh, the land and, and, and the birds. They already have lost uh, a two thirds of the original 140 native birds in, in Hawaii and 15 of the remaining 17 honey creepers are losing out to malaria. So for, for nine years, scientists and, and other groups in Hawaii have been preparing this ambitious project to release lab-bred mosquitoes that have been infused with a bacteria that will act as a kind of birth control when those mosquitoes uh, mate with, with wild mosquitoes. It's, it's complicated and fascinating, and it's about to be launched uh, later this year is kind of a moonshot because there's so many players, volunteers, state and federal agencies involved. It's definitely a, a story to watch and it begins to enter in when this chapter on, on, on Hawaii, we get into the, the some of the extreme measures that are, are, are in the works that may be needed to halt the kind of losses that we've seen in places like Hawaii. Now, this is a woodpecker, but it's not just any woodpecker. This is the red cockaded woodpecker. And he's a bird that looked to be um, doomed just a few decades ago. But what came to its rescue was none other, none other than the US military. So what happened is as the country began to develop, military bases across the country became islands of undisturbed land. And so now these bases are home to some 500 species of rare birds and animals, insects, and plants. And at first, as you might imagine, military commanders were not in the least bit interested in playing nursemaid to a bunch of birds. But um, it, it was sort of sad, really. The soldiers at Fort Bragg, which is now called Fort Liberty, were driving tanks through the red cockaded woodpeckers um, nesting grounds, and they were building um, new barracks in the woodpecker habitat. So this purposefully kind of uh, to, 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 to show that they could do what they wanted to do. Well, they sort of could, but all of a sudden they couldn't yeah. <laughs> because they got into a skirmish with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Department, which is, of course, the agency that um, oversees all of the uh, endangered wildlife in this country. And so um, after a few back and forths, uh, a few sort of maybe unpleasant meetings, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife went in and shut down basic training at the largest military base in the country. Well, that got the attention of the U.S. military, and they did an about face. So the Department of Defense has a lot of money and a lot of motivation to, um, to get this job done so that they can go back to their primary business of defending the country. 
So if you fast forward a few years, now the U.S. military has embraced its role and has become a national model for wildlife conservation. They show what, they show what can be done when we put our minds and our best um, scientific powers to work on it. So the red cockaded woodpecker is the pickiest bird that you would ever want to see. He can only drill his cavity in a longleaf pine tree that's 80 to 100 years old. And the tree has to be dying, but not yet dead. So basically, it takes him 10 years to build the cavity because of all of the sap that the tree gets, gives off. And if you remember um, from your history uh, lessons when you were younger, the um, longleaf pines and these pine trees were responsible for all of this pitch and turpentine that um, the country used in the early days to build ships and other things. Um, so what happens is, is the bird comes and he pecks a little bit into the tree and then he has to go away and wait for the tree to heal itself and stop oozing all of this, um, all of this sap. And then he comes back and starts the process all over again until the point where it takes about a decade. But what was happening is there weren't enough trees really left, plus this process was just taking too long. So eventually the military scientists figured out how to make an artificial cavity for the woodpecker that could be installed in the tree in just one afternoon. And it was exactly like the woodpecker liked it. So what you sort of started finding was that at 15 military bases all across the country, you had these artificial cavities springing up in trees, sort of like government housing right. Right. Um, spreading around. And sure enough, the birds love them. And now the population of the red cockaded woodpecker has recovered, almost nearly recovered, um, 25 years ahead of schedule. Right. And that's just one example of what the military uh, uh, services devoted to this have done is, is at work in, in bases all across the country, and it's really interesting. So we, we, um, we, we mostly had a great adventure putting this together, but... Well, it was mostly, uh, mostly a great adventure, but as you, um, Mike, if you think about it, we had sort of spent our work lives sitting behind desks, and we were getting a little bit older, mostly you yeah, were getting yeah, a little bit older. Right. And um, suddenly we found ourselves out there on the front lines following um, people around who think nothing of hiking straight up a mountainside for 10 miles or staring down um, boars and elk and wild pigs and other really scary things. <laughs> um, and it seemed like that we were always, always wearing the exact wrong kind of shoes. Right. So one example of this was when we were in the um, snake infested swamps of Louisiana looking for this iconic bird, the ivory billed woodpecker. So we found ourselves um, standing on the edge of the swamp and um, our leader has on hip waders and he's carrying a machete and we have on our basic little hiking boots. And so, Anders bravely got behind the leader and he got right behind him and I saddled up right behind Anders and we started off and then the leader stopped and he looked back and he said, you know, it's usually the third one in line who gets bit. So suddenly I just like basically jumped in front of Anders. He was willing to sacrifice me on, on, on that one. <laughs> Right. But, you know, it wasn't until we got to Hawaii that things really got a bit drastic. Right. So in, in Hawaii, we went way up into uh, into the interior uh, elevated regions to to uh, watch a project where they're trying to save uh, seabirds, including this great shearwater that, that, that nest way at the highest uh, elevations. And we went that day to meet with the uh, scientist Andre Rain uh, in the island of Kauai. And when I got there, he says, uh, well, do you have your um, uh, spiked heels on your boots. And I, I said, no, I, I didn't. He said, well, we'll find some for you. He looked around these offices, didn't find any, and then said, well, we'll be fine. Let's go on up. So we we head up in, into the mountains and we were following this, this wooden, uh, this I'm sorry, this dirt path along the edge of a cliff that drops right down 3,000 feet 
to the Pacific Ocean glistening down below on a beautiful sunny day. And everything was great until it started to pour rain, which often happens in, in Hawaii. And suddenly that path turned into a mudslide. I'm grabbing onto different branches, trying to keep from slipping and sliding right on the edge of the cliff. And Andre turned around and, and says to me, listen, if you're going to fall, fall to the right, because if you fall to the left, it's all over. <laughs> we did not fall. We managed to survive that. But it, it drove home uh, how you know, perilous it often is, uh, this folks that are working out in the, in the far edges of this, this work where the birds are often in, in, in need of this kind of research. And it, it's quite a challenge and very impressive. And we were really interested in seeing all that. Um, in the second half of, of the book, we look at the, the broader issues surrounding the future of birds in, in North America. What's going on that can help not just individual species along the lines of what we've been talking about, but the wider expanse of birds. And there's good and, and bad news here. And we devote uh, a full chapter on the growing realization among a group of ranchers and farmers. And here's one of them that we told the story of out of Kansas that have realized that if they make room for birds on, on their land, it's not only good for the wildlife, but it can lead to a more productive and even more profitable operation. And that's a key concept that is slowly catching on and is terribly important because grasslands, of course, are where some of the, the deepest losses have been. Um, another uh, really encouraging development is coming from the same group of scientists who conducted the 3 million bird research. Um, and uh, they got together after they had put, out, put that out and said, we've got to do more than just report the, the, the trouble. So they put together a, a project called the Road to Recovery that is currently raising, it hopes to raise $50 million to put more emphasis on basic research and take a lot of these impressive technologies that we're talking about and spread them more, more broadly to, to species before they approach uh, extinction. Now, this is Pete Mara, who is head of Road to Recovery. And, uh, and here's John Fitzpatrick uh, in the um, uh, lab. Uh, he's part of the advisory group on this. And there's another really important lesson that can be had um, out of the game bird conservation successes um, that ought to be used on other species. And for generations, we have had this remarkable model that's that's working uh, with this segment of, of, of birds, largely because there's strong political support and there's money coming in. The key, of course, is the flow of billions of dollars to date, $17 billion from the sale of ammunition, guns, bows, and arrows that enable the protection of breeding and migratory grounds. And it's built this network in, in addition to uh, that of the wildlife, refuges, and, and research that needed. So, Game birds are up, populations are up more than 50% at the time when so many other birds are in, in such dramatic decline. So what does that tell us that we ought to be trying to do uh, with, with, those, um, with those lessons? And at this point, I'm gonna turn us our uh, sharing off and just talk a little bit. So that's really the good news. And um, a wing and a prayer also lays out sort of what still stands in the way. And at the top of the list, of course, is the continued loss of habitat, followed by the ambivalence that our country has really always had about devoting resources to wildlife management. There's also still struggles between economic interests and conservation needs. And really the sad fact is, is that our state and federal conservation system has failed to keep up with the pace of these losses of our bird populations. And, and it's pretty clear that the leadership that's needed here is not likely to come from our political uh, segment or government agencies as it has done in, in the past. Con Congress has proven largely unable to make decisions on, on, on this front. And the country has meanwhile allowed the Endangered Species Act, which turns 50 this year, to become so underfunded and backed up that it can take years and sometimes decade for a bird or other wildlife just to get an assessment. You know, the system that had been the world's model now seems built for another time. And it's, it's a time 
for uh, serious consideration of reform. Uh, and you know, a good example uh, of what, what's not being done, the, the most significant legislation in a generation that would help badly needed monies to flow through state agencies, that's the Restoring America's Wildlife Act, has stalled in Congress uh, in the US Senate after passing the House, despite 10 years of work by a bipartisan a coalition in support of this idea. So um, a lot of the leadership is coming from other places now, including um, major nonprofits, of course, the Cornell Lab and Audubon, and also the American Bird Conservancy, the Nature Conservancy, and Ducks Unlimited, just to name a few. And phil philanthropies that are responding, especially to the challenges of climate change, are also having a big impact on birds at the same time. And most, most significantly, birds are, as we all know, and I think Cornell's at the center of this, drawing more public interest than, than ever before. And that's partly because of the pandemic taught us to look outside and, and you've seen this big surge in interest. Uh, but the last you know, comprehensive study uh, uh, found that, that more than 50 million people consider themselves bird watchers. And that's a number that's probably quite a bit low since it was uh, several years ago that that, 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 was, that happened. And a great example of this is that more than 900,000 people are using um, the lab's eBird app in what's become the largest citizen science project in the world. eBirders have now submitted 83 million checklists of the birds that they have seen. And um, the lab's Merlin sound idea is absolutely spreading like wildfire to help people figure out what species they're hearing everywhere that we have gone. Um, when we've been talking with uh, folks about our book, people are just raving about sound ID. We, in fact, have our breakfast uh, to it just about every morning um, when the weather is nice, listen to the birds. Um, we've been also really encouraged um, by the partnership between the New York Times and Cornell that's producing a steady flow of coverage and helping the lab to expand its eBird database. So we end up hopeful that this country will take advantage of what is clearly a unique moment, a time when the knowledge of birds is deeper than it has ever been before. The powers of avian research are accelerating and we're seeing the responsibility for playing a role spread beyond the sort of traditional scientists, wildlife professions to farmers and ranchers and hunters and birders and private landowners, which is really important. So we're basically at a time where anyone who's willing um, to help birds can have an impact. Um, we end a wing and a prayer with an afterward listing dozens of things that just about anybody can do um, to help birds. Everything from how you um, protect birds around your home and your business to uh, supporting birds in the marketplace with bird-friendly products like bird-friendly coffee and now even bird-friendly beef and bird-friendly maple syrup. Um, and of course, um, it's really important for people who contribute to um, our nonprofits and research centers to continue to, um, to do that as well. So uh, a note to, to end on, and then we'll, we'll get into uh, questions. Uh, we can't tell you how many times in, in our travels we heard the expression canary in the coal mine come up, you know, about the role that, that birds play because they're so sensitive to the environment. This, of course, goes back to a time when canaries were used to alert miners when there were changes in, in the air uh, underground. But today, birds are telling us in very specific terms that, that we need to respond to changes in this broader picture. And uh, this is a time when clearly we need to be listening to what they're telling us. So thank you so much for joining uh, this webinar and we'd love to get into questions and thoughts on all this. Great. Thank you, Anders and Beverly for that great presentation. A lot of people were marveling about the photos. So uh -oh. I'd love for you to share a little bit about the photos. Yeah, so, so the, the photos um, is something I've, I've loved uh, photography since I was a young reporter years ago. And when digital photography came back in a big way, not too, too long ago, the, the, the abilities to, uh, to, to, to shoot birds have advanced tremendously. So I just got really deep into that. And everywhere we go, 
I would take pictures. Now, what's so interesting to me is that I am not alone. You know, there's tons of you know amateur photographers out there now taking pictures of birds, uh, and I think it fills the internet with a way to look at birds, and I hope help birds in certain ways. So. I work under the theory that if you shoot enough, you might get a good picture. <laughs> so, so uh, that has been a big part, uh, an enjoyable part of all this. That's wonderful. One of the first questions that popped into the Q and A, um, they were wondering, you know, you you started your birding journey. Did you have a certain spark bird that just kind of hooked you into birding, or was it just like a gradual descent into birding madness that we all get? <laughs> yeah. Well, what really happened for us is that we were camping. So we were out in the woods and all of a sudden we were just surrounded by the birds. Just there they were. And it was kind of like being um, kind of in the pandemic and microcosm because we were just there. It was like, oh my gosh, what are these? But what has started, uh, what started us really on the road and chasing birds was probably that little prothonotary, uh, the little gold ball that you saw we um we just really had to see it and so we really uh yeah. kept going until we did and we've written about and sh shot endless pictures of prothonotaries just because they're you know they just glow like gold yeah. so that was probably our spark bird oh that's great um so one thing that i was curious about you know everything's so digital right now like we use zoom and we we you know conduct meetings across time and space but you decided to pack up your airstream and take this wild journey what was it that made you want to go into the field instead of having meetings or reading books i mean you did all those things too but what was it about getting out there well um basically we've been journalists and feature writers um mostly me features but anders also some in his career and there's just nothing like being out there and just being with um somebody and really seeing what they're doing and being able to like the more you see the more questions you have and of course um kind of selfishly it meant that we were going to get to see some of the most amazing birds on the planet um so that yeah. didn't it didn't hurt at all. <laughs> right. That's the more time you spend with people, that's where you really get the story. We wanted to bring, I mean, the, the, there's a, a lot of information out there, but the challenge is to tell a story, which is the, the challenge of any book like this. So we were trying to be able to develop the narratives that you can only get by hanging around people until they're tired of you. <laughs> Some people notice that you've been on a book tour and they've seen your presentations and they want to know like, if you're still touring and if you might be uh, showing up in a city near them, is that on your website or how can people yeah, sure find is. that? And on, our, on our website, we have a, a section called our, our book, our new book, and it's got a list of where we're going to be. We're slowing down a little bit now. Um, we just had a wedding of our youngest, so that took us off the road for a while, delightfully. Um, but we do have a number of, of, of dates planned for the fall, and they're on the website. Great. I'm just adding that into the chat so people can go and see. And I wanted to also say if people are interested in um, picking up a copy of your book, that um, our webinar attendees can get $5 off the list price. So I'm just going to put that in the chat before uh, I lose and my I'm going to put this back up here um, uh, if I could. Uh, and, and it has a little bit of information. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there so they, you've got your website and your Facebook and an email. So yeah, thank you for providing that information. And I'll also, I'll pop that in the chat. And for anyone who's watching, the webinar is going to be recorded and we're going to send it out tomorrow with all this information so that if you have trouble like finding all the links right now, don't worry, I'll compile them. We'll get them to you. Um, there's so many great questions coming in. So I want to kind of get back to some of the questions that people are asking. I got some in email before the webinar. And I wanted to talk about like a hopeful story. So you were in your book, you talked about the bald eagle as like the success story of our time. Um, and our, uh, the person who submitted the question, they were wondering if they, that same model is being used with other endangered birds. And if so, is it being successful? Yeah. Well, the eagle is both a wonderful success story, but also... Um, different than a lot of the challenges today, because there was really one single thing DDT that led to uh, the collapse of that and other birds. 
once that was addressed and banned in 1973, that cleared the way. It was followed up with a, a lot of conservation, of course, uh, but the eagle has advantages. It's our national symbol. It has special legislation protecting it so that that is possible to use when it's threatened. So while the eagle, I think, is a, a wonderfully symbolic story, um, it, other birds uh, with, without that glamour uh, ha have trouble meeting that, that standard. So it is and it isn't, I would say. Would you think? Yeah, I think that's, that's, right. that's right. And it's important to note that the eagle now, despite that growth now, so we tell the story of how the eagle has now uh, multiplied to the point, there's almost a half a million eagles in Canada and, 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 and the U.S., but there's just also was a recent discovery that eagles are threatened uh, by uh, lead poisoning that has been spreading and to almost half of the bald and golden eagles are, are, are found to have high levels of lead poisoning uh, so it can cause a slow death or certainly cripple them. And while we have banned lead in hunting ducks and geese, we have not been willing to do that for the sake of other birds because the, the eagles will consume carrion that's that uh, that uh, hunters use lead, um, you know, various uh, game, uh, various you know shooting and leaving that in the field. The, the eagles uh, consume that, and that's how they get lead poisoning. So that's something that needs to be addressed and ought to have been addressed. A lot of the people we talked to felt that this was the time to push for that. It's our national symbol that's protected. Yeah. Um, I've gotten a few questions about the Florida scrub jay. And among, one of the questions is they're interested in learning more about the conservation efforts uh, to preserve habitat. And some people are wondering like, is the Florida scrub jay, because around here we have blue jays and they're, they're everywhere um, and they're easy to attract them to your yard. But is that same thing true for a Florida scrub jay? What makes it so difficult to conserve this species? Well, the scrub jay is a bird that likes it where he likes it. <laughs> and where he likes it is in a very particular type of environment in Florida that um, is really old. It's these giant sort of sandy, they used to be sand dunes back in the um, millions of years ago. But now this particular habitat is, is a part of Florida that you don't even necessarily know exists because, you know, it's very arid and, um, and dry. And that habitat is um, is very particular to certain areas of Florida. So no, you're not gonna have a scrub jay um, probably flying down to <clears throat> other parts of the country for sure. And the challenge is that that's also area where a lot of development is taking place. So as we said, 90% of the scrub land has been lost. The challenge with the scrub jay is that the, the chunks are getting smaller and smaller. How do they make the most of that land? And also how do you connect these little chunks of, of possible habitat for them. And there's been some progress in that. Florida recently passed a corridors legislation that will invest millions of dollars into trying to make it possible for wildlife to move around the state. Florida has done a good job in some ways uh, of, of protecting its wildlife at the same time as they face all this pressure from all the growth that's occurring. That's why we see that as a story that's sort of emblematic of the overall pressure on, on birds. And the reason why it's important, well, there are probably lots of reasons, but one of the main reasons why it's important for, to connect these habitats is so that the um, scrub jays can go find mates. And if, if they don't, if they don't go out to new territories, then you start to have inbreeding, which really is not a good thing. Eventually leads to a lot of genetic pro um, problems with the birds. Lots of the birds. Yeah, they do quite the intricate mapping of the families of the scrub jays. It's yeah. pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, another question that I'm seeing um, was actually about bird-friendly beef, because often we think of beef as a really like intensive practice, farming cattle. And so I, it wasn't part of your presentation, but I love this section of your book where you talked about the Flying W Ranch in Kansas. And I'd love if you could just share with our audience what makes this, this ranch so special and, and so bird friendly. Sure. And in fact, ranches, it's easier for ranches to make room for birds than for farms where they've plowed up uh, so much of, of the soil. And on this ranch, it simply basically returned it to the state that it had been in 
before it was a, a ranch. And that's just fine for the certain kind of cattle that they raise there uh, and, and, and works very well. Uh, native plants, uh, lack of pesticide, uh, making room. We camped out on, on this one part of the, of, of the ranch. In the morning, we would wake up and it was just a whole symphony of birds were, were out there. Uh, not far from where the cattle are, so they can coexist if if the the ranchers are willing. And in this case, they're proving that not only is it good for uh, the, the 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 birds and other wildlife, but it makes them a more productive ranch. So basically, if you've heard of um, sort of like free ranging chickens, well, these are free ranging cows. So they're not confined um, to feedlots at certain times. They really um, go out and they um, eat almost all of the natural grasses and the, um, the different flowers and these things called forbs, which I didn't even know what a forb was before we started, um, started our work on this. But um, essentially the cows um, don't have antibiotics or any of those kinds of things. They just basically eat the natural grasses and they know what's good for them. So they will actually eat different things at different times of the year based on what they just naturally need. So it's pretty, it's a pretty fascinating story. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of questions about whether in the end, you saw so many things that were probably like very hopeful, but also maybe sad and a little discouraging. So in right. the end, you're, what were you like, did you feel hopeful at the end? Did you feel like, what, what was your takeaway when you put the book down and you're like, I feel good about the way things are or, ooh. <laughs> now, the, way, the way we looked at this uh, in, in the end was that there are all these pieces of the puzzle spread out across this country and into, into Latin America as well that can save birds and are saving birds and could help to put some of this back together, at least halt the losses. But they're like a puzzle and they haven't been put together. We don't have the overarching concept that we've had at several points in our history. And that's what we're arguing needs to occur now. And it's not just good for the birds. It's, it's good for everything that lives here. And that's sort of the point we make. Right. And, and you know, it is time for, um, well, hopefulness, I guess I would say, is the impact that people can have. There are a lot of things that you can do and things that are important to do. And um, sometimes it's a small thing, um, like maybe uh, keeping your cat inside. Um, you wouldn't think that, you know, just keeping your cat indoors could be so important. But if people did keep their cats inside and not um, let feral cats range, we'd save about what, 2.6 2 billion, billion birds a year that um, cats kill for sport, not for food. And um, another thing that uh, we became aware of was how um, groups like American Bird Conservancy and Audubon and um, some other groups, the Nature Conservancy, they have on their website um, places that you can go and get involved in um, signing online petitions for um, legislation that's coming up and knowing what measures are, um, are happening. And we really also liked uh, what um, Hillary Swain at the um, uh, Archbowl. Archbowl told us is that in the end, all conservation is local. Mm -hmm. So the person who basically goes to the town commission's planning board meeting and you know makes a plea for better water quality and um, basically is just on it in your town, if we all do our part, then these smaller things add up to bigger things. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of questions about like, what can I do? And you know, what's the next step? But I think you just did a really eloquent job of, of answering that. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, let's see if I can find another good question here. There's so many and it's hard. Like we're, we probably have time for one or, or two more. Is there anything that Anders or Beverly that you wanted to share before we, we have to wrap up? Yeah, I think I think going back to the points of what can be done, there are 22 different things mentioned in the, in that afterward, mm -hmm. and I think as the the real um, you know the takeaway for us is that 
there's sort of a ladder you go up as first of all, you're interested in birds and then you're, you know, maybe a little bit more obsessed and then you're wondering what's happening with them. And that ladder toward conservation is something that you see taking place. We really need to get to the point where the kind of pressure that came to bear uh, uh, in the 60s and 30s and the, and the 1900s when people rose up and said, we're not gonna let the slaughter of birds continue to occur. We're not seeing that now. There's a lot of things going on in this world that call uh, that, that demand our attention. And so it's you're competing for you know people's attention, but this is one thing that is within reach. And that's kind of the point that we we would make that the 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 solutions are within reach. We have legislation that's sitting right there on the edge of being approved. And it's bipartisan. Bipartisan. I mean, it's conservation not... and um saving birds is something that you know, really can go across any aisle. Everyone agrees that that it's important to save our birds. And I think to me too, the thing that makes me hopeful is the more people realize that what's good for birds is really good for us, is good for people. Um, you know, that's where um, we're gonna take the time to really say, okay, these birds, they're, they're sending us a clear message. It's not pretty if we don't take care of, of the environment and if we don't do certain things. So when birds are happier, we're all happier. <laughs> And, and, and one other point on that is I think, you know, we're, we're focused very much on climate issues these days. We see it playing out, you know, every day uh, 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 in, in floods and forests and Hawaii situation is that, that uh, the, the, the imperatives of responding to climate go hand in hand with what's needed for birds. Sometimes the climate issues seem overwhelming, like we're powerless to do something about it. But if you look at this sort of subset, which is what what's happening with birds, it's a clear set of concrete things that can be done that do respond to this broader set of issues. So it's kind of a window into seeing what, what needs to be done, what can be done, and what can have some impacts. Yeah, I thank you so much. Um, one, for writing the book. I've, <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. It was like, you know, a lot of familiar, familiar names and and birds and learning new things. And I love how you wove the connections together and made it just really um, quite a work of storytelling that also provides these actionable steps that people can take. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for the book and for drawing attention to this issue in a way that's really approachable um, and connects people. Um, so thank you for joining us tonight and for, for talking about your book and for sharing your story and your beautiful photos. It's been a pleasure connecting with you both. Oh, well, thank you guys. Thanks it's so been much. our pleasure. And Have thanks to time. everyone who yes. tuned in. Thanks so much, Chelsea. Yeah. yeah. Thanks to our audience for their wonderful questions. Um, I can see that they're very active in the chat and in the Q&A. So obviously it connected with them as well. I'm going to be emailing our webinar attendees tomorrow. So you'll get the recorded version of the webinar. You'll get the link for the discount on the book, uh, the link for Beverly and Anders' website. Um, but I also wanted just to note that these webinars are a free resource from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and they're made possible by our members. So if you're interested in becoming a member of the lab, you can visit birds.cornell.edu. Um, and I just want to thank you once again, Beverly and Anders and our audience, and have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.